going up to the battle with a snazzy rifle if everybody else has brought tanks. All organisations need to continuously evolve. You don't have a choice in this. So I'm going to quickly recap, because I've covered a lot of ground there. Um, we looked at what is cloud computing, and I, I looked at the answers from the sublime to the utterly ridiculous. Um, cloud computing is not, contrary to popular perception, a new concept. It describes a highly disruptive transition of IT from a product to a service world. And we really don't have a great deal of choice about whether we're going to adopt it or not. Going back to the example of the Industrial Revolution, or what I like to call Mrs. Mung's Inc., I mean, we can no more avoid cloud computing than Mrs. Muggins could avoid the Industrial Revolution. So that's the theory. What about the practice? Well, as I said, activities which are ubiquitous world of fire are becoming suitable for service provision. And that's not just one particular aspect of IT. Those activities can occur anywhere in the computing stack. Now, this unfortunately has given rise to what we, we generally call the different asses of cloud computing. So, for example, you have uh, software as a service, or SaaS, uh, where you have providers like Salesforce, you have PaaS, or Platform as a Service, providers like Windows Azure, and you have EaaS, which is Infrastructure as a Service, providers like Amazon. I must admit, I'm not a big fan of these terms, because you may as well just call it software as a product, platform as a product, infrastructure as a product, in, in the old world, so SAP, PAP, and EAP. Um, it's simply all of this is doing, it's reflecting the fact that these activities have shifted from a product to a service world. But it has one important distinction. It creates a boundary, an air, a division of responsibility between you and a provider. So for example, let's pretend that you are using a company like Salesforce. Well, you're obviously <coughs> concerned about your data, whereas Salesforce is concerned about Writing the application and all the things underneath that. So the framework is built in, the operating system, the machinery it runs on. Any one of these layers, whether it's software, whether it's platform, whether it's infrastructure, is all about some components being on your side that you're concerned about and some components being on the provider's side and what they're concerned about. Because, but unfortunately, this is actually a delusion. And the reason why it's a delusion is because your data actually doesn't exist outside of this. It actually exists on their system. And that actually creates a risk. So the types of risks it creates, and there are two basic forms. There are transitional risks related to the formation of this new industry. And that's things like management, uh, trust, whether you trust the vendors, whether there's transparency in their operations, and the security of supply but it also creates the normal outsourcing risks of suitability of the activity, pricing competition, locking, and second sourcing. Now, second sourcing is an important one, um, so I'm just going to pick on this one for a moment. If we take the example that you're using a software as a service provider, so they are concerned with the underlying systems and your data exists on that system. If something goes wrong, um, and that, it, it could be a disaster, it could be it was bought out by another company and that has happened and then closed down. Then you've got to somehow get your data out of that system. But the thing is, you get your data out of the system and that's pretty useless because all you've got is data. So your choices are to rebuild everything that they've done in order to run it or you need to find another provider. So. You shift your data over to another provider, but of course your data is only going to work in another provider if they're pretty much running exactly the same systems as was originally in the first provider. <clears throat> in order to get second sourcing, you actually need these things. You need portability of data, code, whatever happens to be in that provider. You need a choice in destinations. You need interoperability or standard outputs between the providers. And you need easy switching. Without these, you do not have second sourcing. 
But we've actually been here before. The whole thing about standard outputs, uh, easy switching, uh, all goes back to Paul Baran's work on the security of supply back in the 1960s. Now, for those of you who don't know, Paul Brown's work led to an awful lot of different network protocols. And what we ended up with many years ago was a mass of different protocols, IPX, SPX, Banyan Vines, Apple Tool, SNA, DeckNet, until we got consolidation in the industry around one particular protocol, TCP IP, principally because it was open, <coughs> and also because it was supported by upstream open source systems. <coughs> so if we just take the infrastructure layer, the computing stack. Where we are today is something like this. We have a mass of different protocols and different APIs, none of which um, have become the de facto standard. We are in that sort of IPX, SPX versus TCP IP versus DEC next stage. Now off these, one, and that's the Amazon EC2 API, is the most dominant. So as in Ubuntu, uh, what we've actually done is we've said, well, rather than create our own API, which seems to be the flavor of the month at the moment, everybody is creating either an API or a, an API of APIs, we would actually adopt someone else's API. So we found an open source system called Eucalyptus, which actually matches the Amazon EC2 API. So we introduced this last April into the uh, Ubuntu distribution, and principally, this enables all the Ubuntu users in the world to build their own private clouds which match the Amazon EC2 API and also to run Ubuntu on Amazon EC2 so you have much easier switching between the two environments. Now this is a first step. What we're actually trying to do is create a competitive marketplace of different providers just like you have within the electricity industry. But in order to do that we need to get standardization. We need to get standardization around APIs. And the reality is that's only going to happen if those standards are not specifications, but actually defined by running code or open source reference models. So to quickly recap, cloud computing, <clears throat> underneath all the, the noise, it really just describes a disruptive shift of IT activities from a product to a service world. And it's governed by a number of different factors. The concept, suitability, technology, and attitude. Now, we can't really avoid this change. I know people talk about, well, we may not adopt it, but you can no more avoid it than people could avoid the Industrial Revolution. There are, obviously, risks. Some are transitional, will be solved. Some are all to do with outsourcing, and things like locking and second sourcing options. But, you know, there are solutions to those risks, and we've also been here before. So the real question is whether we're going to learn the lessons of history, or whether we're just going to actually repeat them. And unfortunately, at this moment in time, in the cloud space, repeating the same lessons of the past seems to be the way we are going. So thank you. Just before I despair off, did you all follow that? Or did I lose it? <laughs> a horrified face there. Did, did, I, did I lose you? <laughs> we uh, didn't get a minute.